Hello. Today we are going to do a cheat solution of the Schrodinger equation for a hydrogen atom. You'll recall that in my video on deriving the Schrodinger equation, we ended up with a time-independent Schrodinger equation of the following form. E psi equals minus h bar squared over 2m times d2 psi by dx squared plus v of psi. But what does that actually mean? This is a formula which is very similar in its context to classical mechanics that tells you something about how a particle is and what its future is likely to be. In this particular case, the Schrodinger equation is telling us something about the energy of the particle. In our case, we're going to be looking at the electron in a hydrogen atom. Now, to solve that equation, you would strictly have to insert the potential energy, which is the Coulomb force between the electron and the proton. And thus, the formula would become E psi equals minus h bar squared over 2m d2 psi by dx squared plus, of course, you now have to do this in three dimensions, so it's d2 psi by dy squared plus d2 psi by dz squared plus a potential term, and the Coulomb term would be z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r where Z, of course, is 1 for hydrogen because there's only one proton in a hydrogen atom. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space, and R is the polar coordinate distance between the proton and the electron. And therein lies part of the problem as to why it is so complicated to solve the Schrodinger equation, because we have this part of the Schrodinger equation in x, y, and z coordinates, but this part of the Schrodinger equation is in polar coordinates. You have to convert to all of one particular type. And generally, it's better to convert to polar coordinates. And then it becomes really rather complicated, and it's worthwhile asking a mathematician to sort it out. But we're going to do the solution by a slightly cheating method. We're not going to actually use the Schrodinger equation, but we're going to end up with the same result. What we're going to do is we are going to look at three formulae and use those. Formula number one says that total energy is kinetic energy plus potential energy. And for, for our electron, that will be half mv squared, that's the kinetic energy, minus z e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r, which is the Coulomb potential. It is the potential between two charges, the proton and the electron. Z, of course, is 1, but I'm going to keep it in because we should be able to derive a more general solution at the end of this exercise. The second equation I'm going to use is to look at the centripetal acceleration of the electron as it goes round, we're going to assume it goes in a circle, as it goes round the nucleus. And the centripetal acceleration is, or the centripetal force, is mv squared over r. The acceleration is v squared over r. But what produces this centripetal force? It must be the Coulomb force, which is z e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared on this occasion. So what we're essentially saying is that the Coulomb force is the force that provides the centripetal force that keeps the electron in orbit around the nucleus. The third equation that we're going to use is an equation that says that angular momentum is quantized. Why do I say that? Well, let us consider an electron going round a proton in the nucleus. What Quantum mechanics says is you have to think of that electron not simply as a particle, but also as a wave. And it's a standing wave. It goes round in wave form. But here's the rub. It has to come back to the point at which it started. 
And so if we consider that the total length of the orbit is length L, and that we start off at point X, then you can say that the wave function, when we start, is e to the i k x. There is no omega t term here because there is not a travelling wave. We only need the i k x term. You can find out more about why we use this wave formulation in my video on the wave function. So psi is e to the i k x when the electron is at point x. But once the wave has gone all the way round and come back to point x, it has gone a distance x plus l. And so psi equals e to the i k x plus l. But those two wave functions must be the same. So e to the i k x must equal e to the i k x plus l. And that can be written e to the i k x times e to the i k l. The e to the i k x cancels and you end up with e to the i k l equals 1. How can that happen? Well, it can happen if k or l are equal to zero, but that's a rather trivial solution. But it can also equal one if k l equals two pi. Why is that the case? Because if k l equals two pi, then e to the i k l equals e to the i two pi, which equals cosine two pi plus i sine two pi. Sine 2 pi is 0, so that term goes, and cosine 2 pi equals 1. So KL must equal 2 pi or any multiple, whole number integral multiple of 2 pi. I'm going to call it 2 pi m, where m is an integer of value 0, 1, 2, 3, up to any number you like, but it must be an integer number. What is L? L is the distance round the circumference of the circle, and that is simply 2 pi r, where r is the radius of the circle, the distance from the, between the electron and the proton. So 2 pi r times k is 2 pi m, and that means that r times k equals m. But in a previous video, I have shown that k is equal to p over h bar. And therefore, r times p over h bar equals m. r is the radius, and that is a constant. h bar is a constant. And what this means is that, ang that momentum, p, is quantized. rp equals m h bar. p is mv. So MVR equals MH bar, and MVR is angular momentum. And therefore, angular momentum comes in quantized units of whole values of H bar. And that is the third term that we need for this cheat solution of the Schrodinger equation. So now let's proceed. We can write that mv squared, sorry, m squared, v squared, r squared, equals n squared, h bar squared, which is n squared, h squared, over 4 pi squared, since h bar is h over 2 pi. v squared, which is the velocity squared, is n squared, h squared, divided by 4 pi squared, m squared, r squared. 